Chapter 8 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com 8. Fool Three days later, Doc saw his first runner. The tractor was churning through the sand just before sundown, heading toward another one-night stand at a new village. Lou was driving while Doc and Jake brooded silently in the back, paying no attention to the colors that were blazoned over the dunes. The cat-and-mouse game was getting to Doc. There was no real assurance that the village they were approaching might not be the target the lobby had chosen for the next investigation. Lou braked the tractor to a sudden halt and pointed. A figure was running frantically over one of the low dunes with a little red sun behind him. He seemed headed toward them, but as he drew nearer they could see that he had no definite direction. He simply ran, pumping his legs frantically as if all the devils of hell were after him. His body swayed from side to side in exhaustion, but his arms and legs pumped on. "'Stop him!' Jake ordered, and Lou swung the tractor. It halted squarely in the runner's path, and the figure struck against it and toppled. The legs went on pumping, digging into the dirt and gravel, but the man was too far gone to rise. Jake and Lou shoved him through the doors into the tractor, and Doc yanked off his aspirator. The man was giving vent to a kind of ululating cry, weakened now almost to a whine that rose and fell with the motion of his legs. Sweat had once streaked his haggard face, but it was dry and blanched to a pasty gray. Doc injected enough narcotic to quiet a maddened bull. It had no effect except to upset the rhythm of the arms and legs. It took five more minutes for the man to die. The specks were larger this time the size of periods in twelve-point type. The lump at the base of the skull was as big as a small hen's egg. "'From Edison, like the others so far. Jack Cooley,' Jake answered Doc's question. "'Durwood spent a lot of time here on his first expedition, so it's getting the worst of it.' Doc pulled the aspirator mask back over the man's face, and they carried him out and laid him on a low dune. They couldn't risk returning the corpse to its people. This was only the primary circle of infection, direct from Durwood. The second circle could be ten times as large as the infection spread from one to a few to many. So far, it was localized, but it wouldn't stay that way. Doc climbed slowly out of the tractor, lugging his small supplies of equipment, while Jake made arrangements for them to spend the night in a deserted house but the figure of the runner and his own failures to find more about the disease kept haunting Doc. He began setting up his equipment grimly. "'Better get some sleep,' Jake suggested. "'You're a mite more tired than you think. Anyhow, I thought you told me you couldn't do any more with what you've got.' Feldman looked at the supplies he had spread out and shook his head wearily. He'd been over every chemical and combination a dozen times, without results that showed in the limited magnification of the optical mic. He snapped the case shut and hit the rude table with the heel of his hand. There are other supplies. Jake, do you have any signal to get in touch with Molly at the Ryan's house? Three raps on the rear left window. I'll get Lou. No. Doc came to his feet, reaching for his jacket. They're looking for three men now. It's safer if I go alone, and I'm the only one who knows what supplies are needed. With luck, I may even get the electron mic. Got a gun I can borrow? Jake found one somewhere, an old revolver with a few loads. He began protesting, but Doc overruled him sharply. Three men could no more fight off the police than one, if they were spotted. He swung toward the tractor. You'd better start spreading the word on everything we know. If people realize they're already safe or doomed, it'll be better than having them go crazy to avoid contagion. Most of the villages know already, Jake told him. And damn it, get back here, Doc. If you can't make it, turn tail quick, and we'll think of something else. <laughs>
Southport seemed normal enough as Doc drove through its streets. The stereo house was open, and the little shops were brightly lighted. He stopped once to pull a copy of Southport's little newspaper from a dispenser. All was quiet on its front page, too. As usual, the facts were buried inside. The editorial was pouring too much oil on the waters in its lauding of the role of medical lobby on Mars for no apparent reason. The death notices no longer listed the cause of death. Medical knew something was up, at least, and was worried. He parked the tractor behind Chris's house and slipped to the proper window. Everything was seemingly quiet there. At his knock, the shade was drawn back, and he caught a brief glimpse of Molly looking out. A moment later, she opened the rear lock to let him into the kitchen. Shh. She's still up, I think. What can I do, Doc? He tried to smile at her. Hide me until it's safe to get into her laboratory. I've got to— The inner kitchen door was kicked open, and Chris stood beyond it, holding a cocked gun in her hand. It took longer than I expected, Dan, she said quietly. But after your letter, I knew you'd swallow the bait. You bloody fool. Did you really believe I'd start doing research here just because of your imaginings? He slumped slowly back against the sink. So this is a fool's errand, then? There never was any equipment here? The equipment's here. In my office. I guessed your spies would report it, so it had to be here. But it won't help you now, pariah Feldman. He came from his braced position against the sink, like a spring uncoiling. He expected her to shoot, but hoped the surprise would ruin her aim. Then it was too late, and his boot hit the gun savagely, knocking it from her hand. Life in the villages had hardened him surprisingly. She was comparatively helpless in his hands. A few minutes later, he had her bound securely with surgical tape Molly brought him. She raged furiously in the chair where he dumped her, then gave up. They'll get you, Daniel Feldman. Surprisingly, there was no rage in her voice now. You won't get away from us. The planet isn't big enough. I got away from your trial, he reminded her. And I got away and lived when you left me without a chance on the ground of the spaceport. She laughed harshly. You got away, then. You fool. Who do you think gave you the extra battery so you could live long enough to be helped at the spaceport? Who hired a fool like Matthews so you wouldn't get the death sentence you deserved? Who let you get away as an herb doctor for months before you set yourself up as God and a traitor to mankind again? It shook him, as it was probably intended to do. Had she known about the extra battery? He'd always assumed that Ben had returned to give it to him. But in that case, Chris couldn't know of it. Then he hardened himself again. In the old days, she'd always had one trump card he couldn't beat and hadn't expected. But too much was involved for games now. Any police around, Molly? he asked. Molly came back a minute later to report that everything looked clear and to show him where the equipment had been set up in Chris's office. It was all there, including the electron mic, a beautiful little portable model. There was even a small incubator with its own heat source into which he immediately transferred the little bottles he'd been keeping warm against his skin. Most of the equipment had never been unpacked, which made loading it onto his tractor ridiculously easy. "'Better come with me now, Molly,' he suggested at last. Then he turned to Chris, who was watching him with almost no expression. "'You can wriggle your chair to the phone in half an hour, I guess. Knock the phone off and yell for help. "'It's better than you deserve.' unless you really did leave me that battery. You won't get away with it, she told him again, calmly this time. No, he admitted. Probably not. But maybe the human race will if I have time to find an answer to the plague you won't see under your nose. But you won't get away with it either. In the long run, your kind never do. Molly was sniffling as they drove away. It had probably been the best life she'd known, Doc supposed. Chris could be kind to menials. But now Molly's work was done, and she'd have to disappear into the villages. He let her off at the first village and drove on alone. He was itching to get to the microscope now, hardly able to wait through the long journey back to Jake. His impatience grew with each mile. Finally, he gave up 
he swung the tractor into a small gully between sand dunes, left the motor idling, and pulled down the shades the villagers used for blackout traveling. There was power enough for the mic here, and the cab was big enough for what he had to do. He mounted the mic on the tractor seat and began laying out the collection of smears and cultures he had brought. It had been years since he'd made a film for the electron mic, but he found it all came back to him as he worked. His hands were sweating with tension as he inserted the first film into the chamber. He had the magnetic lenses set for 20,000 power, but a quick glance showed it was too weak. He raised the power to 50,000. The filaments were there, clear and distinct. He turned on the little tape recorder that had been part of Chris's equipment and set the microphone where he could dictate into it without stopping to make clumsy notes. He readjusted the focus carefully, carrying on a running commentary. Then he gasped. Each of the little filaments carried three tiny darker sections. Each was a cell, complete in itself, with a typical Martian triple nucleus. He put a film with a tiny section of the nerve tissue from a corpse into the chamber next, and again a quick glance at the screen was enough. The filaments were there, thickly crowded among nerve cells. They did travel along the nerves to reach the base of the brain before the larger lump could form. A specimen from one of the black specks was even more interesting. The filaments were there, but some were changed, or changing, into tiny round cells, also with the triple dark spots of nuclei. Those must be the final form that was released to infect others. Probably at first these multiplied directly in epithelial tissue, so there was a rapid contagion of infection. Eventually they must form the filaments that invaded the nerves and caused the brief bodily reaction that was Selznick's migraine. Then the body adapted to them, and they began to incubate slowly, developing into the large cells he had first seen. When ripe, the big cells broke apart into millions of the tiny round ones that went back to the nerve endings, causing the black spots and killing the host. He knew his enemy now, at least. He reached for the controls, increasing the magnification. He would lose resolution, but he might find something more at the extreme limits of the mic. Something wet and cold gushed into his face. He jerked back, trying to wipe it off, but it was already evaporating, and there was a thick, acrid odor in the cab. He grabbed for his aspirator, then tried to reach the airlock, but the paralysis was already spreading through him, and he toppled to the floor before he could escape. When he came to, it was morning outside, and Chris was waiting inside the cab with two big lobby policemen. A hypo in her hand must have been what revived him. She touched the electron microscope with something like affection. The lobby technicians did a good job on this, don't you think, Dan? I warned you, but you wouldn't listen. And now we've even got your own taped words to prove you were doing forbidden research. Fool! She shook her head pityingly as the tractor began moving with two others toward Southport. You and your phony diseases. A little skin disorder, Selznick's migraine, and a few cases of psychosis to make a new disease. Do you think the medical lobby can't check on such simple things? Or didn't you expect us to hear of your open talk of revolt and realize you were planning to create some new germ to wipe out the earth forces? Maybe those runners of yours were real. Mass murderer! She drew out another hypo and shoved the needle into his arm. Necrosynth, enough to keep him unconscious for twenty-four hours. He started to curse her, but the drug acted before he could complete the thought. End recording Chapter 9 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com Nine. Judgment. Doc woke to see sunlight shining through a heavily barred window that must be in the official Southport jail. 
He waited a few minutes for his head to clear, and then sat up. Necrosynth left no hangover, at least. The sound of steps outside was followed by the squeak of a key in the lock. Fifteen minutes, Judge Wilson, the voice said. Thank you, officer. Wilson came into the cell, carrying a tray of breakfast and a copy of the Northport Gazette. He began unloading bracky weeds from his pocket while Doc attacked the breakfast. They tossed the book at you, Doc, he said. You haven't got a chance, and there's nothing the villages can do. Trial set for tomorrow at Northport, and it's in closed session. We can't get you off this time. Doc nodded. Thanks for coming, even if there's nothing you can do. I've been living on borrowed time for a year anyhow, so I have no right to kick. But who's we? The villages. I've been part of their organization for years. The old man sighed heavily. You might say a revolution has been going on since I can remember, though most villagers don't know it. We've just been waiting our time. Now we've stopped waiting and the rifles will be coming out. Rifles made in village shops. The villages are going to rebel even if we're all dead of plague in a month. Doc Feldman nodded and reached for the bracky. He knew this was their way of trying to make him feel his work hadn't been for nothing, and he was grateful for Wilson's visit. It was a good year for me. Damn good. But time is running short. I'd better brief you on the latest on the plague. Wilson began making notes until Doc was finished. Finally, he got up as steps sounded from the hall. Anything else? Just a guess. A lot of earth germs can't live in Mars normal flesh. Maybe this can't live in earth normal. Tell them so long for me. So long, Doc. He shook hands briefly and was waiting at the door when the guard opened it. An hour later, the lobby police took Feldman to the Northport shuttle rocket. They had some trouble on the way. A runner cut down the street with the crowds frantically rushing out of his way. Terror was reaching the cities already. Doc flashed a look at Chris. Mob hysteria. Like flying saucers and wriggly tops, I suppose, he asked before the guard could stop him. They locked his legs but left his hands free in the rocket. He unfolded the paper Wilson had brought and buried his face in it. Then he swore. They were explaining the runners as a case of mob hysteria. Northport was calmer. Apparently they had yet to have first-hand experience with the plague. But now nothing seemed quite real to Doc, even when they locked him into the big Northport jail. The whole ritual of the lobbies seemed like a fantasy after the villages. It snapped back into focus, however, when they led him into the trial room of the medical lobby building. It was a smaller version of his trial on Earth. Fear washed in by association. The complete lack of humanity in the procedure was something from a half-remembered and horrible past. The presiding officer asked the routine question, Is the prisoner represented by counsel? Blaine, the dapper little prosecutor, arose quickly. The prisoner is a pariah, Sir Magistrate. Very well. The court will accept the protective function for the prisoner. You may proceed. I'll be the judge. I'll be the jury. And prosecution. And defense. It made for a lot less trouble. Of course, if Space Lobby had asserted interest, it would have gone to a supposedly neutral court. But as usual, Space was happy to leave it in the hands of medical. The tape was played as evidence. Doc frowned. The words were his, but there had been a lot of editing that subtly changed the imports of his notes. I protest, he challenged. It's not an accurate version. The lobby magistrate turned a wooden face to him. Does the prisoner have a different version to introduce? No, but... The evidence is accepted. One of the prisoner's six protests will be charged against him. Blaine smiled smoothly and held up a small package. We wish to introduce this drug as evidence that the prisoner is a confirmed addict, morally irresponsible under addiction. This is a package of so-called bracky weed, a vile and noxious substance found in his possession. It has alkaloids no more harmful than nicotine, Feldman stated sharply. Do you contend that you find the taste pleasing? Blaine asked. It's bitter, but I've gotten used to it. I've tasted it, the magistrate said. 
Evidence accepted. Two deductions, one for irregularity of presentation. Doc shrugged and sat back. He'd tested his rights and found what he expected. It was hard to see now how he had ever accepted such procedure. Jake must be right. They'd been in power too long and were making the mistake of taking the velvet glove off the iron fist and flailing about for the sheer pleasure of power. It dragged on while he became a greater and greater monster on the record. But finally it was over, and the magistrate turned to Feldman. You may present your defense. I ask complete freedom of expression, Doc said formally. The magistrate nodded. This is a closed court. Permission granted. The recording will be scrambled. The last bit ruined most of the purpose Doc had in mind, but it was too late to change. He could only hope that some one of the medical men present would remember something of what he said. I have nothing to say for myself, he began. It would be useless. But I had to do what I did. There's a plague outside. I've studied that plague, and I have knowledge which must be used against it. He sat down in three minutes. It had been useless. Blaine arose with a smile still plastered on his face. We, of course, recognize the existence of a new contagion, but I believe we have established that this is one disseminated by the prisoner himself and probably not directly contagious. There have been many cases of fanatics ready to destroy humanity to eliminate those they hate. Now surely the prisoner has himself left no question of his attitude. He asserts he has knowledge and skill greater than the entire medical research staff. He has attempted to intimidate us by threats. He is clearly psychopathic, and dangerously so. The prosecution rests. The guards took Doc into the anteroom, where he was supposed to hear nothing that went on, but their curiosity was stronger than their discretion, and the door remained a trifle ajar. The magistrate began the discussion. The case seems firm enough. It's fortunate Dr. Ryan acted so quickly, with some of the people getting nervous. Perhaps it might be wise to publicize our verdict. My thought exactly, Blaine agreed. If we show Feldman is responsible, and that medical is eliminating the source of the infection, it might have a stabilizing effect. Let's hope so. The sentence will have to be death, of course. We can't let such a rebellious psychopath live. But this needs something more, it seems. You've prepared a recommendation, I suppose. There was the case of Albrecht Delier, Blaine suggested. Something like that should have good publicity impact. It struck Doc that they sounded as if they believed themselves, as the witch-burners had believed in witches. He was sweating when the guards led him before the bench. The magistrate rolled a pen slowly across his fingers, and his eyes raked Feldman. Pariah Daniel Feldman, you have been found guilty on all counts. Furthermore, your guilt must be shared by that entire section of Mars known as the Villages. Therefore, the entire section shall be banned and forbidden any and all services of the medical lobby for a period of one year. Sir Magistrate! One of the members of the Southport Hospital staff was on his feet. Sir Magistrate, we can't cut them off completely. We must, Dr. Harkness. I appreciate the fine humanitarian tradition of our lobby which lies behind your protest, but at such a time as this the good of the body politic requires drastic measures. Why not see me after court, and we can discuss it then? He turned back to Feldman, and his face was severe. The same education which has produced such fine young men as Dr. Harkness was wasted on you and perverted to endanger the whole race. No punishment can equal your crimes— but there is one previously invoked for a particularly horrible case, and it seems fitting that you should be the fourth so sentenced. Daniel Feldman, you are sentenced to be taken into space beyond planetary limits, together with all materials used by you in the furtherance of your criminal acts. There you shall be placed into a spacesuit containing sufficient oxygen for one hour of life, and no more. You and your contaminated possessions shall then be released into space to drift there through all eternity as a warning to other men. This sentence shall be executed at the earliest possible moment, and Dr. Christina Ryan is hereby commissioned to observe such execution. And may God have mercy on your soul. End Recording
Chapter 10 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com. 10. Execution The hours of waiting were blurred for Doc. There were periods when fear clogged his throat and left him gasping with the need to scream and beat his cell walls. There were also times when it didn't seem to matter, and when his only thoughts were for the villages and the plague. They brought him the papers where he was painted as a monster beside whom Jack the Ripper and Albrecht Delier were gentle amateurs. They were trying to focus all fear and resentment on him. Maybe it was working. There were screaming crowds outside the jail, and the noise of their hatred was strong enough to carry through even the atmosphere of Mars. But there were also signs that the lobby was worried, as if afraid that some attempt might still be made to rescue him. He'd looked forward to the trip to the airport as a way of judging public reaction, but apparently the lobby had no desire to test that. The guards led him up to the roof of the jail, where a rocket was waiting. The landing space was too small for one of the station shuttles, but a little Northport-Southport shuttle was parked there, after what must have been a difficult set-down. The guards tested Doc's manacles and forced him into the shuttle. Inside, Chris was waiting, carrying an official automatic. There was also a young pilot, looking nervous and unhappy. He was muttering under his breath as the guards locked Doc's legs to a seat and left. All right, Chris ordered. Up ship. I tell you, we're overweight with you. I wasn't counting on three for the trip, the pilot protested. The only thing that will get this into orbit with the station is Faith. I'm loaded with every drop of fuel she'll hold, and it still isn't enough. That's your problem, Chris told him firmly. You've got your orders, and so have I. Up ship. If she had her own worries about the shuttle, she didn't show it. Chris had never been afraid to do what she felt she should. The pilot stared at her doubtfully and finally turned back to his controls, still muttering. The shuttle lifted sluggishly, but there was no great difficulty. Doc could see that there was even some fuel remaining when they slipped into the tube at the orbital station. Chris went out, and other guards came in to free him. So long, Dr. Feldman the pilot called softly as they led him out. Then the guards shoved him through the airlock into the station. Fifteen minutes later, he was locked into one of the cabins of the Iroquois, with all his possessions stacked beside him. He grinned wryly. As an honest worker on the Navajo, he'd been treated like an animal. Now, as a human fiend, he was installed in a luxury cabin of the finest ship in the fleet, with constant spin to give a feeling of weight and more room than the entire tube crew had known. He roamed the cabin until he found a little collapsible table. He set the electron microscope up on that and plugged it in. It seemed a shame that good equipment should be wasted along with his life. He wondered if they would really throw it out into space with him. Probably they would. He pushed a button on the call board over the table and asked for the steward. There was a long wait as if the procedure were being checked with some authority. But finally he received a surly acknowledgment. Steward, what you want? How's the chance of getting some food? You're on first class. They could afford it, Doc decided. He wouldn't cost them much, considering the distance he was going. Bring me two complete dinners, one Earth normal and one Mars normal. Okay, Feldman. But if you think you can suicide that way, you're wrong. You may be sick, but you'll still be alive when they dump you. A sharp click interrupted him. That's enough, steward. Captain Everett speaking, Dr. Feldman. You have my apologies. Until you reach your destination, you are my passenger, and entitled to every consideration of any other passenger except freedom of movement through the ship. I am always available for legitimate complaints. Feldman shook his head. He'd heard of such men, but he'd thought the species extinct. The steward brought his food in a thoroughly chastened manner. He managed to find space for it and came to attention. Is that all? Sir, 
For a moment, as the smell of real steak reached him, Doc regretted the fact that his metabolism had been switched. Then he shrugged. A little wouldn't hurt him, though there was no proper nourishment in it. He squeezed some of the gravy and bits of meat into one of his bottles, sticking to his purpose. Then he fell to on the rest. But after a few bites, it was queerly unsatisfactory. The seemingly unappealing Mars Normal Ragu suited his current tastes better, after all. Once the steward had cleared away the dishes, Doc went to work. It was better than wasting his time in dread. He might even be able to leave some notes behind. A gong sounded, and a red light warned him that acceleration was due. He finished with his bottles, put them into the incubator, and piled into his bunk, swallowing one of the tablets of Morphetal the ship furnished. Acceleration had ended, and a simple breakfast was waiting when he awoke. There was also a red flashing light over the call board. He flipped the switch while reaching for the coffee. Captain Everts, the speaker said, may I join you in your cabin? Come ahead, Feldman invited. He cut off the switch and glanced at the clock on the wall. There were less than eleven hours left to him. Everts was a man of forty, erect but not rigid. There was neither friendliness nor hostility in his glance. His words were courteous as Doc motioned toward the tray of breakfast. I've already eaten, thank you. He accepted a chair. His voice was apologetic when he began. This is a personal matter which I perhaps have no right to bring up, but my wife is greatly worried about this plague. I violate no confidence in telling you that there is considerable unease, even on Earth, according to messages I have received. The ship's physician believes Mrs. Everts may have the plague, but isn't sure of the symptoms. I understand you're quite the expert. Doc wondered about the physician. Apparently there was another man who placed his patients above anything else, though he was probably meticulous about obeying all actual rules. There was no law against listening to a pariah, at least. When did she have Selznick's migraine, he asked. About thirteen hours ago. We went through it together, shortly after having our metabolism switched during the food shortage of eighty-eight. Doc felt carefully at the base of the captain's skull. The swelling was there. He asked a few questions, but there could be no doubt. Both of you must have it, Captain, though it won't mature for another year. I'm sorry. There's no hope, then. Doc studied the man, but Everts wasn't the sort to dicker even for his life. Nothing that I've found, Captain. I have a clue, but I'm still working on it. Perhaps if I could leave a few notes for your physician. It was Everts' turn to shake his head. I'm sorry, Dr. Feldman. I have orders to burn out your cabin when you leave. But thank you. He got to his feet and left as quickly and directly as he had entered. Doc tore up his notes bitterly. He paced his cabin slowly, reading out the hours while his eyes lingered on the little bottle of cultures. At times the fear grew in him, but he mastered it. There was half an hour left when he began opening the little bottles and making his films. He was still not finished when steps echoed down the hall, but he was reasonably sure of his results. The bug could not grow in earth-normal tissue. Three men entered the room. One of them, dressed in a space suit, held out another suit to him. The other two began gathering up everything in the cabin and stowing it neatly into a sack designed to protect freight for a limited time in vacuum. Doc forced his hands to steadiness with foolish pride and began climbing into the suit. He reached for the helmet, but the man shook his head, pointing to the oxygen gauge. There would be exactly one hour's supply of oxygen when he was thrown out, and it still lacked five minutes of the deadline. They marched him down the hallway to meet Everts coming toward them. There were still three minutes left when they reached the airlock, with its inner door already open. The space-suited man climbed into it and began strapping down so that the rush of air would not sweep him outward when the other seal was released. Doc had saved one bracky weed. Now he raised it to his lips, fumbling for a light. Everett stepped forward and flipped a lighter. Doc inhaled deeply. Fear was thick in every muscle, and he needed the smoke desperately. Then he caught himself. Better change your metabolism back to Earth normal, Captain Everts, he said, 
and his voice was so normal that he hardly recognized it. Everett's eyes widened briefly. The man bowed faintly. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. It was ridiculous, impossible, and yet there was a curious relief at the formality of it. It was like something from a play, too unreal to affect his life. Everts nodded to the man holding the helmet. Doc dropped his bracky weed and felt the helmet snap down. A hiss of oxygen reached him, and the suit ballooned out. There was no gravity. The two men handed him up easily to the one in the airlock, while the inner seal began to close. There was still ten seconds to go, according to the big chronometer that had been installed in the lock. The spaceman used it in tying the sack of possessions firmly to Doc's suit. A red light went on. The man caught Doc and held him against the outer seal. The red light blinked. Four seconds. Three. Two. There was a sudden, heavy thudding sound, and the Iroquois seemed to jerk sideways slightly. The spaceman's face swung around in surprise. The red light blinked and stayed on. Zero. The outer seal snapped open, and the spaceman heaved. Air exploded outwards, and Doc went with it. He was alone in space, gliding away from the ship with oxygen hissing softly through the valve and ticking away his life. End recording. Chapter 11 of Badge of Infamy this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater www.prometheusradiotheater.com Eleven Convert. Feldman fought for control of himself, forced himself to think, to hold on to his sanity. It was sheer stupidity since nothing could have been more merciful than to lose this reality. But the will to be himself was stronger than logic. And bit by bit, he forced the fear and horror away from him until he could examine his situation. He was spinning slowly so that stars ahead of him seemed to crawl across his view. The ship was retreating from him already hundreds of yards away. Mars was a shrunken pill far away. Then something blinked to one side. He turned his head to stare. A little ship was less than three hundred yards away. He recognized it as a life raft. Now his spin brought him around to face it, and he saw it was paralleling his course. The ejection of the life raft must have caused the thump he heard before he was cast adrift. It meant someone was trying to save him. It meant life. He flailed his arms and beat his legs together, senselessly trying to force himself closer while trying to guess who could have taken the chance. No one he could think of could have booked passage on the Iroquois. There wasn't that much free money in the villages. Something flashed a hot blue, and the little ship leaped forward. Whoever was handling it knew nothing about piloting. It picked up too much speed at too great an angle. Again, blue spurts came, but this time matters were even worse. Then there was a long wait before a third try was made. He estimated the course. It would miss him by a good hundred feet, but it was probably the best the amateur pilot could do. The ship drifted closer, but to one side. It would soon pass him completely. A space-suited figure suddenly appeared in the tiny airlock, holding a coil of rope. The rope shot out, well thrown, but it was too short. It would pass within ten feet, and might as well have been ten miles for all the good it would do him. Every film he had seen on space seemed to form a mad jumble in his mind, but he seized on the first idea he could remember. He inhaled deeply and yanked the oxygen tank free. An automatic seal on the suit cut off the connection. He aimed the hissing bottle, fumbling for the manual valve. It almost worked. It kicked him toward the rope slightly, but most of the energy was wasted in setting him into a wilder spin. He blinked, trying to spot the rope. It was within five feet now. Again he waited until he seemed to be in position, 
This time, he threw the bottle away from it. It added spin to his vertical axis, but the rope came into view within arm's reach. He grasped it, just as his lungs seemed about to burst. He couldn't hold on long enough to tie the rope. His lungs gave up suddenly, collapsing and then sucking in greedily. Clean air rushed in, letting his head clear. He'd forgotten that the inflated suit held enough oxygen for several minutes. His body struck the edge of the airlock, and a hand jerked him inside. The outer seal was slammed shut and locked, and there was a hiss of air entering. He threw back his helmet just as Chris Ryan jerked hers off. Her voice shook almost hysterically. Thank God, Dan. I almost gave up. I liked the air out there better, he told her bitterly. If you'll open the lock again, I'll leave. Or am I supposed to believe this is rescue and that you just came along to save me? I came along to see you killed, as you know very well. Saving you wasn't in my orders. He grunted and reached for the handle that would release the outer lock. Better get back inside if you don't want to blow out with me. It's up to you, Dan, she told him, and there was all the sincerity in the world in her blue eyes. I'm on your side now. He began counting on his fingers. Let's see. The spare battery, the delay in arresting me, the choice of Matthews. It was all true. Anger began to grow in her eyes. Dan Feldman, you get inside this raft. If you don't care about me, you might consider the people dying of the plague who need you. She'd played her trump, and it took the round. He followed her. All right, he said grudgingly. Spill your story. She held out a copy of a space radiogram, addressed to Mrs. D. E. Everts, and signed by one of the best doctors on the lobby board of directors. Regret confirmed diagnosis. Top secret. Repeat, top secret. Martian fever incubates fourteen years. Believed highly fatal. No cure. Research beginning immediately. Penalty violation top secret. Death all concerned. Mrs. Everts rates a top secret break. Doc commented dryly. Come off it, Chris. She's the daughter of Elmer's of Space Lobby, Chris answered. She pointed to the message, underlining words with her finger. Fourteen years. You couldn't have caused it. Highly fatal, and people are being told it's only a skin disease. Research beginning, but you've already done most of the research. I can see that now. I can see a lot of things. You've got me beat, then, he said. I can't see how such a reformed young noblewoman calmly walked over and stole a life raft. I can't see how your brilliant mind concocted this whole scheme in almost no time. And to be honest, I can't even see why Medical Lobby decided to save me at the last minute and sent you to do the job. You didn't have to spy out knowledge from me. I've been trying all along to get it to your research division. She sighed and dropped onto a little seat. I can't prove my motives. You'll just have to believe me. But it wasn't hard to do what I've done. That shuttle pilot was found in a routine check, stowed away on the life raft. I was with Captain Everts when he was found, so I discovered how to get into the raft. And I heard his whole confession. He wasn't the real pilot. He'd come from the villages to save you. The whole scheme was his. I just used it, hoping I could reach you. As always, her story had a convincing element she shouldn't have known. The pilot's farewell, addressing him as Dr. Feldman, had been too low for her to hear, but it was something that fitted her story. It was probably a deliberate clue to give him hope, to assure him the villages were still trying. It shook his confidence. And your motive? Your real motive? he insisted. She swore at him, then began ripping off the spacesuit. She turned her back, pulling a thin blouse down from her neck. He stared, then reached out to touch the lump there. So you've had Selznick's migraine, and you know you're carrying the plague, and you've decided your precious lobby won't save you. She dropped her eyes, then raised them to meet his defiantly. I'm not just scared and selfish. Dad caught it, too, and it must be close to the time for him. He switched to Mars Normal when he was a liaison agent and never changed back. Dan, are we all going to have to die? Can't you save him? Feldman was out of his suit and at the control panel. There was a manual lever which Chris must have used before. It might work out here where there was room to maneuver and nothing to hit, but trying to make a landing was going to be different. Dan, she repeated. He shrugged. I don't know, 
They've started research too late, and they'll be under so much pressure that the real brains won't have a chance. The top-secret stuff looks bad for research. Maybe there's a cure. It works in culture bottles, but it may fail in person. When I'm convinced I'm safe with you, I may tell you about it. Oh. Her voice was low. Then she sighed. I suppose I can understand why you hate me, Dan. I don't hate you. I'm too mixed up. Tomorrow, maybe. But not now. Shut up and let me see if I can figure out how to land this thing. He found that the fuel tanks were nearly full, but that still didn't leave much margin. Mars must have been notified by Everts and be ready to pick up the craft. He had to reach the wastelands away from any of the shuttle ports. They had no aspirators, however, and they couldn't cover much territory in the spacesuits they would have to use. It meant he'd have to land close to a village where he was known. He jockeyed the ship around by trial and error, studying the manual that was lying prominently on the control panel. According to the booklet, the ship was simple to operate. It was self-leveling in an atmosphere, and automatic flare computers were supposed to make it possible for an amateur to judge the rate of descent near the surface. It looked reassuring, and was probably written with that in mind. Finally, he reached for the control, hoping he'd figured his landing orbit reasonably well by simple logic. He smoothed it out in the following hours as he watched the markings on Mars. When they were near turnover point, he began cranking the little gyroscope to swing the ship. It saved fuel to turn without power, and he wasn't sure he could have turned accurately by blasting. He was gaining some proficiency, however, he felt. But now he had to waste fuel and ruin his orbit again. There was no way to practice maneuvering without actually doing so. In the end, he compromised, leaving a small margin for a bad landing that would require a second attempt, but with less practice than he wanted. He had located Jake's village through the little telescope when he finally reached for the main blast control. The thin haze of Mars's atmosphere came rushing up while the blast lashed out. Then they were in the outer fringes of the sky, and the blast was beginning to show a corona that ruined visibility. He turned to the flare computer and back to what he could see through the quartz viewport. He was going to land about a half mile from the village, as nearly as he could judge. The computer seemed to work as it should. The speed was within acceptable limits. He gave up trying to see the ground and was forced to trust the machinery designed for amateur pilots. The flare bloomed, and he yanked down on the little lever. It could have been worse. They hit the ground, bounced twice, and turned over. The ship was a mess when Feldman freed himself from the elastic straps of the seat. Chris had shrieked as they hit, but she was unbuckling herself now. He threw her her spacesuit and one of the emergency bottles of oxygen from the rack. Hurry up with that. We've sprung a leak, and the pressure's dropping. They were halfway to the village when a dozen tractors came racing up, and Jake piled out of the lead one to drag the two in with him. Heard about it from the broadcasts and figured you might land around here. Good to see you, Doc. He started the tractor off at full speed back to the wastelands, while Doc stared at the armed men who were riding the tractors. Jake caught his look and nodded. You're in enemy territory, Doc. There's a war going on. End recording. Chapter 12 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com. Twelve. War. Sometimes it seemed to Doc that war was nothing but an endurance race to see how many times they could run before they were bombed. He was just beginning to drop off to sleep after a long trip for the sixth consecutive day when the little alarm shrilled. He sighed and shook Chris awake. Again, she protested, but she got up and began helping him pack. Jake came in, his eyes weary, pulling on the old jacket with the big star on its sleeve. Doc hadn't been too surprised to learn that Jake was the actual leader of the rebels. 
Shuttle spotted, taking off this way. I still can't find out where the leak is. They haven't missed our location once this week. Here, give me that. He took the electron mic that had been among Doc's possessions, but Chris recaptured it. I can manage, she told him, and headed out for the tractor where Lou was waiting. Doc scowled at her. He and Jake had been watching her. She was too useful to Doc's research to be turned away, but they didn't trust her yet. So far, however, they had found nothing wrong with her conduct. Still. He swung suddenly into Jake's tractor. Just remembered something. How'd they find me that time I stopped in the tractor to use the mic? I was pretty well hidden, and no tracks last in the sand long enough for them to have followed. But they were there when I came to. Somehow they must have put a radio tracer on me. Jake waited while they lighted up, his eyes suddenly bright. You mean, something you got from her house was bugged? It figures. And I've still got all the stuff. Now they find wherever we set up headquarters, though they've always managed to miss my laboratory, even when they've hit the troops around us. Jake, I think it's the microscope. Doc managed to push enough junk off one of the seats to make a cramped bed and stretched out. Sure, we figured they sent her because they want to keep tabs on what I discover. They've finally gotten scared of the plague, and she's the perfect Judas goat, but they have to have some way to get in touch with her. I'll bet there's a tracer in the mic and a switch so she can modulate it or key it to send out Morse. Yeah, Jake nodded. Well, she does her own dirty work. I might get to like her if she was on our side. Okay, Doc, if they've put things into the mic, I've got a boy who'll find it and fix it so she won't guess it's been touched. Doc relaxed. For the moment, there would be no power in the instrument, nor any excuse for her to use it. But she must have handled some secret arrangement during the work periods. She used the mic more than he did. The switch could be camouflaged easily enough. If anyone detected the signal they'd probably only think it was some leak in the electrical circuit. Far away, the shuttle rockets had appeared as tiny dots in the sky. They were standing on their tails a second later, just off the ground, letting the full force of their blasts bake the area where the headquarters had been. Jake watched grimly, driving by something close to instinct. Then he looked back. Know anything about a Dr. Harkness? Not much, except that he protested sealing off the villages. Why? He and five other doctors were picked up, trying to get through to us. Claimed they wanted to give us medical help. We can use them, God knows. I guess I'll have to chance it. They stopped at a halfway village and hid the tractors before looking for a place to rest. Doc found Chris curled up asleep against the microscope. He had a hard time getting her to leave it in the tractor. But she was too genuinely tired to put up any real argument. Jake reported in the morning before they set out again. You were right, Doc. It was a nice job of work. Must have taken the best guys in Southport to hide the circuit so well. But it's safe now. It just makes a kind of meaningless static nobody can trace. Maybe we can get you a permanent lab now. Doc debated again having Chris left behind and decided against it. The lobby was determined to let him find a cure for them, if he could. That meant Chris would work herself to exhaustion trying to help. Let her think she was doing it for the lobby. It was time she was on the receiving end of a double-cross. It's a stinking way to run a war, he decided. Jake chuckled without much humor. It's the war you wanted, remember? They forced our hand, but it had to come sometime. Right now the lobby's fighting to get their hands on your work before we can use it. They're just using holding tactics, which helps our side. And we're hoping you get the cure so we can win. With that, maybe we'll whip them. It was a crazy war, with each side killing more of its own men than of the enemy. The runners were increasing, and Jake's army was learning to shoot the poor devils mercifully and go on. They knew at least that there was no current danger of infection. In the lobby towns, more were dying of panic in their efforts to escape the runners. Desert towns had joined the villages, reluctantly but inevitably, to give the rebels nearly three-quarters of the total population but the lobby forces in the few cities held most of the real fighting equipment, and they were ready to wait until Earth could send out unmanned rockets loaded with atomics, which could cut through space at ten times normal speed. There were vague lines of battle, but time was the vital factor. The lobbies waited to steal a cure for the plagues, and the villages waited until they could announce it and demand surrender as its price. It looked as if both sides were doomed to disappointment, however. 
He and Chris had put in every spare minute between moving and the minimum of sleep in searching for something that would check the disease. It couldn't grow in an Earth-normal body, but it didn't die either. And there wasn't enough normal food available to permit the switchover for more than a handful of people. Even Earth was out of luck, since 80% of her population ate synthetics. There were ways to synthesize Earth-normal food, but they were still hopelessly inefficient. Jake had ordered one of the villages to rebuild their plant for such a purpose, while another was producing the enzyme that would permit switching. But it looked hopeless for more than a few of the most valuable men. No progress? Jake asked for the hundredth time. Doc grinned wryly. A lot, but no help. We found a fine accelerator for the bug. We can speed up its incubation, or even make someone already infected catch it all over again. But we can't slow it or stop it. The new laboratory was still being fitted when they arrived. It had been dug into one of the few real cliffs in this section of Mars. The power plant had been installed, complete with a steam plant that would operate off sunlight in the daytime through a series of heat valves that took in a lot of warm air and produced smaller amounts hot enough to boil water. I'll see you whenever I can, Jake said. But mostly you're going to be somewhat isolated so they won't trace you. Let them think they goofed with the shuttles and hit you and Chris. Anything you need? Guinea pigs, Doc told him sarcastically. It was meant as a joke, though a highly bitter one. Jake nodded and left them. Doc opened the cots as Chris came in, not bothering to unpack the equipment. Hit the sack, Chris, he told her. She looked at him doubtfully. You almost said that the way you'd address a human being, Dan. You're slipping. One of these days you'll like me again. Maybe. He was too tired to argue. I doubt it, though. Forget it and get some sleep. She watched him silently until he got up to turn out the light. Then she sighed heavily. Dan. Yeah? I never got a divorce. The publicity would have been bad. But anyway, we're still married. That's nice. He swung to face her briefly. And they found the radio in the microscope. Better get to sleep, Chris. Oh. It was a quiet exclamation, barely audible. There was a sound that might have been a sniffle if it had come from anyone else. Then she rolled over. All right, Dan. I still want to help you. He cursed himself for a stupid fool for telling her. Fatigue was ruining what judgment he had. From now on, he'd have to watch her every minute. Or had she really seen the value of the research by now? She wasn't a fool. It should have registered even on her stubborn mind. But he was too sleepy to think about it. She had breakfast ready in the morning. She made no comment on what had been said during the night. Instead, she began discussing a way to keep one of the organic antibiotics from splitting into simpler compounds when they tried to switch it over to Mars Normal. They were both hopelessly bad chemists and biologists, but there was no one else to do the work. Chris worked harder than ever during the day. Just after sundown, Jake came in with a heavy box. He dropped it on the floor. Mice! Doc ripped off the cover, exposing fine screening. There were at least six dozen mice inside. Harkness found them, Jake explained. A hormone extraction plant used them for testing some of the products. Had them sent by regular shipments from Earth. Getting them cost a couple of men, but Harkness claims it's worth it. He's a good man on a raid. Here. He'd gone to the doorway again and came back with another box, this one crammed with bottles and boxes. They had quite a laboratory, and Harkness picked out whatever he thought you could use. Chris and Doc were going through it. The labels were engineering ones, but the chemical formulae were identification enough. There were dozens of chemicals they hadn't hoped to get. Anything else? Doc finally asked as they began arranging the supplies. More runners. A lot more. We're still holding things down, but it's reaching a limit. Panic will start in the camps if this keeps on. But that's my worry. You stick to yours. Several of the new chemicals showed promise in the tubes, but two of them proved fatal to the mice, and the others were completely innocuous in the little animals' bodies, both to mouse and to germ. 
The plague was much hardier in contact with living cells than in the artificial environment of the culture jars. They lost seven mice in two days, but that seemed unimportant. The females were already living up to their reputations, nearly all pregnant. Doc didn't know the gestation period, but he remembered that it was short. Funny they all started at the same time, he commented. Must have been shipped out separately or else been kept apart while they were switched over to Mars normal. Something interrupted their habits anyhow. A few nights later they learned what it was. There was a horrible squealing that woke him out of the depths of his sleep. Chris was already at the light switch. As light came on, they turned to the mouse box. All the animals were charging about in their limited space, their little legs driving madly and their mouths open. What they lacked in size they made up in numbers, and the din was terrific. But it didn't last. One by one the mice began dropping to the floor of the cage. In fifteen minutes they were all dead. It was obviously the plague, contracted after having their metabolism switched. Women were sterile for some time after Selznick's migraine struck, and the same must have been true of the mice. They must have contracted the plague at about the same time and reached fertility together. Somehow, the plague incubation period had been shortened to fit their lifespan. The disease was nothing if not adaptive. Chris prepared a slide in dull silence. The familiar cell was there when Doc looked through the microscope. He picked up one of the little creatures and cut it open, removing one of the fetuses. Make a film of that, he suggested. She worked rapidly, scraping out the almost microscopic brain, dissolving out the fatty substance and transferring the result to a film. This time, even at full magnification, there was no sign of the filaments that were always present in diseased flesh. The results were the same for the other samples they made. Something about the very young animal or a secretion from the mother's organs keeps the bug from working. Doc reached for a bracky weed and accepted a light from Chris without thinking of it. Every kid I've heard about contracted the plague between the second and third year. None are born with it. None got it earlier. I've suspected this, but now here's confirmation. Chris began preparing specimens while Doc got busy with tubes of the culture. They'd have to test various fluids from the tiny bodies, but there were enough cultures prepared. Then if the substance only inhibited growth, there would be a long, slow test. If it killed the bugs, they might know more quickly. Jake came in before the final tests, but waited on them. Doc was studying a film in the microscope. He suddenly motioned excitedly for Chris. See the filaments? They're completely disintegrated, and there's one of the big cells broken open. We've got it. It's in the blood of the fetus, and it must be in the blood of the newborn children, too. Jake looked at the slide, but his face was doubtful. Maybe you got something, Doc. I hope so. And I hope you can use it. He shook his head wearily. We need good news right now. A couple of big rockets just reached the station, and they've been sending shuttles back and forth a mile a minute. Nobody can figure out how they got here so fast or what they're for. But it doesn't look good for us. End recording. Chapter 13 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com 13. Susceptibility Doc could feel the tension in the village where GHQ was temporarily located long before they were close enough for details to register. The people were gathered in clusters, staring at the sky where the station must be. A few were pacing up and down, gesticulating with tight sweeps of their arms. One woman suddenly went into even more violent action. She leaped into the air and then took off at a rapid trot and then a run. Her hands were tearing at her clothes, and her mouth seemed to be working violently. 
She was halfway to the top of the nearest dune before a rifle cracked. She dropped, to twitch once, and lie still. Almost with her death, another figure leaped from one of the houses, his face bare of the necessary aspirator. He took off at a violent run, but he was falling from lack of air before the bullet ended his struggles. The people suddenly began to move apart, as if trying to get away from each other. For weeks they had faced the horror with courage. Now it was finally too much for them. Tension mounted as no news came from the cities. Doc noticed that it seemed to aggravate or speed up the disease. He saw three men shot in the next half hour. He was trying to calm them with word of a possible cure for the plague, but their reactions were as curiously dull as those of Jake had been. As he spoke, they faced him with set expressions. At his mention of the need for the blood of young children, they turned from him, sullenly silent. Jake came over, nodding unhappily. It's what I was afraid might happen, Doc. George Lynn. Tell Doc what's wrong. Lynn was reluctant, but he finally stumbled out his explanation. It ain't like you, Doc. Comes from that lobby woman you got. It's her dirty idea. We've seen the lobby doctors cutting open our kids, poisoning their blood and bleeding them dry. That ain't gonna happen again, Doc. You tell her it ain't. Doc swore as he realized their ignorance. An unexplained vaccination looked like poisoning of the blood, but he couldn't understand the bleeding part until Jake filled him in. Northport's infant wing. Each department has its own blood bank, and donation is compulsory. Southport started it a couple months ago, too. The long arm of the lobby had reached out again. Now if he ever got them to try the treatment, it would only be after long sessions of preparing them with the facts, and there was hardly enough time for the crucial work. By afternoon, Judge Ben Wilson reached them. His voice shook with fatigue as he climbed up to address the crowd through a power megaphone. Southport's going crazy. He had to pause for breath between each sentence. Earth's pulling back all the important people. They're packing them into ships. They're leaving only colonials with no Earth rights. Those ships left when they decided the plague was coming from here. They won't let anybody back until the plague is licked. There won't be an Earth technician on Mars tomorrow. No bombs? someone called. No bombs. The ships must have started before you rebelled. Maybe meant honestly to save their own kind. But now it's a military action. And don't think it won't mean trouble. The poor devils in the city bet on the wrong horse. Now they can't run their food factories or anything else for long, not without technicians. They've got to whip you now. Up to this time they've been fighting for the lobbies. Now they'll fight for their own bellies to get your supplies. And they've still got shuttle rockets and fuel for them. Now beat it. I gotta confer with Jake. Doc started after the judge, but Dr. Harkness caught his arm and drew him aside. Chris followed. I've found another epidemic, Harkness told them over at Marconi. It kept me on the run all night, and now half the village is down with it. Starts like a common cold, runs a fair fever, and the skin breaks out all over with bright red dots. He went on describing it. Chris began asking him about what medical supplies he had brought with him, pilfered from Northport Hospital. She seemed to know what it was, but refused to say until she saw the cases. Doc also preferred to wait. Sometimes things weren't as bad as they seemed though usually they were worse. Marconi was dead to all outward appearances, with nobody on the streets. It had been a village of great hopes a week before, since this was where they had decided to experiment with switching the people back to Earth normal. They'd had the best chance of survival of anyone on Mars, until this came up. Three people lay on the beds in the first house Harkness led them to. The room was darkened, and a man was stumbling around, trying to tend the others, though the little spots showed on his skin. He grinned weakly. Hi, Doc. I guess we're making a lot of trouble, ain't we? Chris gave Doc no chance to answer. Just as I thought. Measles. Plain, old-fashioned measles. Figured so, said the sick man. Like my brother back on Earth. The others looked doubtful, but Doc reassured them. Chris should know. She'd worked in a swanky hospital where the patients were mostly earth-normal. Measles was one of the diseases which was foiled by the metabolism switch. Well, at least they wouldn't have to be quarantined here. 
Chris finished treating the family with impersonal efficiency, discussing the symptoms loudly with Harkness. It's a good thing it isn't serious. No, Harkness answered bitterly. Not serious. It's only killed five children and three adults so far. It would here, Doc agreed unhappily. He led Chris out of the room on the pretext of washing his hands. It's serious enough to force us to abandon the whole idea of going back to Earth normal. Measles today, smallpox, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, and everything else tomorrow. These people have lived Mars normal so long their natural immunity has been destroyed. On Earth, where the disease was everywhere, kids used to pick up some immunity with constant exposure, even without what might be called a case of the disease. Here, the blood has no reason to build antibodies. They can be killed by things people used to laugh at. How the disease got here, I don't know, but it's here. So we'll have to give up the idea of switching back to Earth normal. He gathered up one of the kits and started toward the other houses. And Lord knows how long it will take to get the blood for the other treatment, even if it works. They worked as a team for a while, with Harkness frowning as he watched Chris. Finally, the young doctor stopped Chris outside the fifth house. These are my patients, Dr. Ryan. I left the lobby because I didn't believe colonials were mere livestock. I still feel the same. I appreciate your help in diagnosis and methods of treatment, but I can't let you handle my patients this way. Dan? She swung around with eyes glazing. Dan, are you going to stand for that? I think you'd better wait in the tractor, Chris. He was lucky enough to catch the kit she threw at him before its precious contents spilled, but it wasn't luck that guided his hand to the back of her skirt, hard enough to leave it stinging. Her face froze and she stormed out. A moment later they heard the tractor start off. But Doc had no time to think of her. He and Harkness split up and began covering the streets, house by house, while he passed on the word to abandon the metabolism switch and go back to Mars normal. Jake sent two other doctors to relieve them in the late evening. Things were somewhat quieter at GHQ as Doc reported the events at Marconi. "'Where's Dr. Ryan?' Jake asked at last. Doc exchanged glances with Harkness. "'She isn't in the lab?' "'Wasn't there an hour ago.' Doc cursed himself for letting her go. With the knowledge that the radio and the mic was still disabled, she'd obviously grabbed for the first chance to report back and with her had gone news of the only cure they had found. Jake took it as philosophically as he could, though it was a heavy blow to his hopes. They spent half the night looking for her tractor, on the chance that she might have gotten lost or broken down, but there was no sign of it. She was waiting in the laboratory when he returned at dawn. Her face was dirty, and her uniform was a mess, but she was smiling. She got up to greet him, holding out two large bottles. Infant plasma straight from Southport. And if you think I had it easy lying my way in and out of the hospital, you're a fool, Dan Feldman. If the man who took my place there hadn't been a native idiot, I never would have gotten away with it. The things he had suspected could still be right, he realized. She could have reported everything to the lobby. It was a better explanation than her vague account of bullying her way in and out. But she'd had a rough drive, and he wanted the plasma. Curiously, he was glad to have her back with him. He reached out a hand for the bottles. She put the bottle on the table and grabbed up a short-bladed knife. Not so fast, she cried. Her eyes were blazing now. Dan Feldman, if you touch those bottles until you've crawled across the floor on your face and apologized for the way you treated me the last few days, I'll cut your damned heart out. He shook his head, chuckling at the picture she made. There were times when he could almost see why he'd married her. All right, Chris, he gave in. I'll be darned if I'll crawl, but you've earned an apology. Okay? She sighed uncertainly. Then she nodded and began changing for work. End recording. Chapter 14 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. 
Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com Fourteen. Immunity. They worked through the day in what seemed to be armed truce. There was no coffee waiting for him when he awoke next, as he'd come to expect, but he didn't comment. He went to where she was already working, checking on the results of the plasma on the cultures. The response had been slower than with the mouse blood, but now the bugs seemed to be dead. The filaments were destroyed, and there were no signs of the big cells. It seemed to be a cure, at least in the culture bottles. We'll need volunteers, he decided. There should be animals, but we don't have any. At least this stuff isn't toxic. We need a natural immune and someone infected, two of each, so one can be treated and the other used for a control. Makes four. Not enough to be sure, but it will have to do. Two, Chris corrected. You're not infected. I am. Two others, he agreed. I'll get them from Jake. Most of GHQ was out on the street, but Doc found Jake inside the big schoolroom where he enjoyed his early morning bracky and coffee. The chief listened and agreed at once, turning to the others in the room. Who's had the jumping headache? Okay, Swanee. Who never had it? He blinked in surprise as three men nodded out of the eight present. I guess you go, Tom. The two men stood up, tamping out their weeds, and went out with Doc. Chris had everything set up. They matched coins to decide who would be treated. Doc noticed that Chris would get no plasma while he was scheduled for everything. He watched her prepare the culture and add the accelerator that would speed development and make certain he and Tom were infected, then let her inject it. That was all, except for the waiting. To keep conditions more closely alike, they were to stay there until the tests were finished, not even eating for fear of upsetting the conditions. Swanee dug out a pack of worn cards and began to deal, while Doc dug out some large pills to use as chips. It was an hour later when the pain began. Doc had just won the pot of fifty pills and opened his mouth for the expected gloating. He yelled as an explosion seemed to go off inside his head. Even closing his mouth was agony. A moment later, Tom began to sweat. It got worse, spreading to the whole area of the back of the head and neck. Doc lay on the cot, envying Chris and Swanee, who had already been infected naturally. He longed desperately for Bracky, and had to keep reminding himself that no drugs must upset the tests. It was the longest day he had ever spent, and he began to doubt that he could get through it. He watched the little clock move from one minute to nine over to half a minute, and hung breathless until it hit the nine. There was no question about whether the infection had taken. Now they could dull the agony. Chris had the anodyne tablets already dissolved in water, and Swanee was passing out three lighted bracky weeds. It took a few minutes for the relief of the anodyne, and even that couldn't kill all the pain. But it didn't matter by comparison. He sucked the weed, mashed it out, and began dealing the cards again. They had a plentiful supply of the anodyne and used it liberally during the night. The test was a speeded-up simulation of the natural course of the disease, where painkiller would take time to get for most people here, but would then be used generously. Precisely at nine in the morning, Chris began to inject Swanee and Doc with plasma. Now there was no thought of cards. They waited, trying to talk, but with most of their attention on the clock. Doc had estimated that an hour should be enough to show results, but it was hard to remember that an hour was the guess as to the minimum time. He winced as Chris took a tiny bit of flesh from his neck. She went to the other men, and then submitted to his work on herself. Then she began preparing the slides. Feldman. She read the name of the slide as she inserted it into the microscope. Then her breath caught sharply. Only dead cells! It was the same for Swanee and Tom. Each had to look at his own slide and have it explained before the results could be believed. But at last Chris bent over her own slide. A minute later she glanced up, nodding. What it should be. It checks. Tom whooped and went out the door to notify Jake. There was only plasma for some two hundred injections, but that should yield sufficient proof. 
Once salvation was offered, there should be no trouble convincing the people that blood donations from their children were worthwhile. Later, when the last of the plasma had been used, they could finally relax. Chris slipped off her smock and dropped onto the cot. A tired smile came onto her lips. "'You're forgiven, Dan,' she said. A moment later she was obviously asleep. Doc meant to join her, but it was too much effort. He leaned his head forward onto his arms, vaguely wondering why she was calling off the feud. It was night outside when he awoke, and he was lying on the cot, though he still felt cramped and strained. He stirred, groaning, and finally realized that a hand was on his shoulder, shaking him. He looked up to see Jake above him. Chris was busy with the coffee maker. Jake slumped onto the cot beside Doc. "'We took Southport,' he announced. That knocked the sleep out of Doc's system. "'You what?' "'We took it. Lock, stock, and barrel. I figured the news of your cure would put guts into the men, and it did. But we'd probably have taken it anyhow. There wasn't anything to fight for there after Earth pulled out and the plague really hit. Wilson mistook last-minute panic for fighting spirit.' The poor devils didn't have anything to fight about once the lobby stopped goading them. Doc tried to assimilate the news, but once the surprise was gone, he found it meant very little. Maybe his revolutionary zeal had cooled once the lobby men had pulled out. We'll need a lot more plasma than there is in Southport, he said. Not so much, maybe, Jake denied. Doc, three of the men you injected were shot down as runners. Your plasma's no good. It takes time to work, Jake. I told you there might be a case or two that would be too close to the edge. Three is more than I expected, but it's not impossible. There was plenty of time. They blew after we got back from Southport. Jake dropped his hand on Doc's shoulder and his face softened. Harkness tested every man you injected. He finished half an hour ago. Five showed dead bugs. The rest of them weren't helped at all. Doc fumbled for a weed, trying to think, but his thoughts refused to focus. Five? Five out of two hundred. That's about average. And what about Tom? He was jumping around after the test last night, telling how you'd cured him, how he'd seen the dead bugs. But he never had the jumping headache, and you never gave him the plasma. He's got dead bugs, though. Harkness tested him. Doc let his realization of his own idiocy sink in until he could believe it. Jake was right, Tom had never been treated. Yet Chris had reported dead bugs. They'd all been so ready to believe in miracles that no one had been able to think straight after the long wait. There was a bump on his neck, a, a small one, he said slowly. Jake, he must have caught it, even if he seemed immune. If he was taking anodyne anyway for something, or, or unconscious. He was in Northport. Six years ago for a kidney operation, Jake admitted doubtfully. We had to chip in to pay for it, but you still didn't treat him and he's cured. Face it, Doc, that plasma is no good inside the body. His hand tightened on Doc's shoulder. We're not blaming you. We don't judge a man here except by what he is. Maybe the stuff helps a little. We'll go on using it when we get it. Tell everybody you were a mite optimistic so they'll figure it's a gamble, but have a little hope left. And you keep trying. Something cured it in Tom, now you find out what. Doc watched him go out numbly and turned to Chris. It can't be right, she said shakily. You and Swanee were cured. Maybe it was the accelerator. It had to be something. You didn't have the accelerator, he accused. No. And I've still got live bugs. I was never supposed to be cured, so I expected to see just what I saw. How I missed the fact that Tom should have been like me, I don't know. Damn it! Oh, damn it! He'd never seen her cry before except in fury. But she mastered it almost at once, shaking tears out of her eyes. All right. Plasma works in a bottle, but not in an adult body. Maybe something works in the body, but not in a bottle. Maybe. And maybe people are just naturally immune after it reaches a certain stage. Maybe we ran into a coincidence. But he didn't believe that any more than she did. The answer had to be in the room, 
He'd taken a massive dose of the disease and been cured in a few hours. Outside the room, the war went on, drawing toward a close. The supposed partial cure was good propaganda, if nothing else, and Jake was widening his territory steadily. There was only token resistance against him. He had the Southport shuttles now to cover huge areas in a hurry, but inside the room the battle was less successful. It wasn't the accelerator. It wasn't the tablets of anodyne. They even tried sweeping the floor and using the dust without results. Then another test in the room, made with four volunteers, Jake selected, yielded complete cures after injections with plain salt water in place of plasma. The plague speeded up again. About four people out of a hundred now seemed to have caught the disease and cured themselves. They accounted for what faith was left in Doc's plasma and gave some unfounded hope to the others. Northport fell a week later, putting the whole planet in rebel hands. Jake returned wearier than ever. He proved to be one of the natural immunes, but the weight of the campaign that could only end in a defeat by the plague left him no room to rejoice in his personal fortune. This time he looked completely defeated, and a moment later Doc saw why as Jake flipped a flimsy sheet onto the table. It bore the seals of space and medical lobbies. Jake pointed upwards. The war rockets are there, all right. We knew they'd come. Now all they want for calling them off is our surrender and your cure. If they don't get both, they'll blow the planet to bits. We have two days. The rockets could be seen clearly with binoculars. There were more than enough to destroy all life on the planet. Maybe they'd be used eventually anyhow, since the lobbies wanted no more rebellion— but with a cure for the plague, he might have bought them off. Chris stood beside him, looking as if it were a bitter pill for her, too. She'd risked herself in the hands of the enemy, had cooperated with him in everything she'd been taught to oppose, and had worked like a dog. Now the lobbies seemed to forget her as a useless tool. They were falling back on a raw power play and forgetting any earlier schemes. Maybe they'd hold off for a while if I agreed to go to them and share all my ideas, specimens, and notes, he said at last. Do you think your lobby would settle for that, Chris? I don't know, Dan. I've stopped thinking their way. She seemed almost apologetic for the admission. He dropped an arm over her shoulder and turned with her back to the laboratory. Okay, then. We've got to find a miracle. We've got two days ahead of us. At least we can try. But he knew he was lying to himself. There wasn't anything he could think of to try. End recording. Chapter 15 of Badge of Infamy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater www.prometheusradiotheater.com Fifteen. Decision Two days was never enough time for a miracle, Doc decided as he packed his notes into a small bag and put it beside his bundle of personal belongings. He glanced around the room for the last time and managed a grin at Jake's gloomy expression. Maybe I can bluff them, or maybe they'll string along for a while, he said. Anyhow, now that they've agreed to take me and my notes in place of the cure we're fresh out of, I've got to be on that shuttle when it goes back to their men at Orbital Station. Jake nodded. I don't like selling friends down the river, Doc, but but it wouldn't do you any more good to blow up with the planet, I reckon. They won't call off the war rockets when they do get you, of course. But maybe they won't use them, except as a threat to put the lobbies back in, stronger than ever. He stuck out one of his awkwardly shaped hands, clapped the aspirator over his face, and hurried out. Doc picked up his bags and went toward the little tractor where Lou was waiting to drive him and Chris back toward Southport and the shuttle rocket that would be landing for them. 
They hadn't mentioned Chris in their demands, but her father must expect her return. After they had him, he'd be on his own. His best course was probably to insist on talking only to Ryan at medical lobby, and then being completely honest. The room here would be kept sealed in case the lobby wanted to investigate where he had failed, and his notes were honest, which was something that could usually be determined. Chris could testify to that anyhow, since she'd kept a lot of them for him. At best, there would be a chance for some compromise, and perhaps some clue for them that might eventually end the plague. They had enough men to work on it, and billions in equipment. At worst, he should gain a little time. Cheer up, Chris, he told her as he climbed through the little airlock. Maybe Harkness will turn up the cure before our negotiations break down. He has the whole of Northport Hospital to play with. They haven't tried to chase him out of there yet. After all, we almost found something with no equipment except wild imaginations. She shook her head as the tractor began moving. Shut up. I've got enough trouble without your coming down with Lageria. Don't be a fool. Why change now, he asked her. Everything I've done has been because I am a fool. I guess my luck lasted longer than I could expect, and I'm still fool enough to think that the solution has to turn up eventually. We know it has to be in that room. Damn it, we must know it. If only we could think straight now. She reached over and touched his hand, but made no comment. They had been over that statement of desperation too many times already, but it kept nagging at him. Something in the room, something in the room, something so common that nobody noticed it. They passed a crowd chasing down a runner. Something in that room could have saved that unlucky man. It could have saved Mars, perhaps. He growled for the hundredth time, cursing his fatigue-numbed mind. Too little sleep, too much coffee and bracky. He reached for the package of weed, realizing that he would miss it on Earth if he ever got there. Like everything here on the planet, he'd begun by detesting it and wound up finding it the thing he wanted to keep forever. He lighted the bracky and sat smoking, watching Lou drive. When the first was finished, he lighted another from the butt. She put out a hand and took it away. Please, Dan, I can stand the stuff, but I'll never like it. And the tractor's stuffy enough already. I've taken enough of it. And it keeps reminding me of our test, the three of you stinking up the place, puffing and blowing that out, while I couldn't even get a breath of air. She was getting Lageria herself now, and... The answer finally hit him. He jerked around, making a grab for Lou's shoulder, motioning for the man to head back. Bracky, it has to be. Chris, that's it. Jake picked out the second group of men from his friends, and they're all cronies because they hang around so much in their so-called smoking room. The first time, it killed the bugs for all of us who smoked, and it didn't work for you because you never learned the habit. Lou had the tractor turned and the rheostat all the way to the floor. She was sitting up now, but she wasn't fully satisfied. The percentage of immune seems about right, but why do some of the smokers get the disease while some don't? Why not? It depends on whether they pick up the habit before or after the disease gets started. Tom must have got his while he was in Northport. They wouldn't let him smoke there, if he had the habit before, for that matter. She found no fault with that. He twisted it back and forth in his mind, trying to find a fault. There seemed to be none. The only trouble was that they couldn't send a message that Bracky was the cure and hoped that Earth would prove it true. No polite note of apology would do after that. They had to be sure. Too many other ideas had proved wrong already. Jake saw them coming and came running toward the laboratory, but Lou stopped the tractor before it reached the building and let the older man in. Get me a dozen men who have the plague. I want the worst cases you have, and ones that Harkness tested himself, Doc ordered, and then start praying that the cure we've got works fast. Chris was at the electron mic at once, but one of her hands reached out for the weed. She began puffing valiantly, making sick faces. Now other men began coming in, their faces struggling to find hope, but not daring to believe yet. Jake followed them. We'll test at ten-minute intervals. That will be about two hours for the last from the group, Doc decided. One of the doctors Harkness had brought to the villages was busy cutting tiny sections from the lumps on the men's necks, while Chris ran them through the microscope to make sure the bugs were still alive. The regular optical mic was strong enough for that. Doc handed each man a bracky weed, 
with instructions to keep smoking no matter how sick it made him. There were no results at the end of ten minutes when the first test was made. The second, at the end of twenty minutes, was still infected with live bugs. At the half hour, Chris frowned. I can't be sure. Take a look, Dan. He bent over, moving the slide to examine another spot. I think so. The next one should tell. There was no doubt about the fourth test. The bugs were dead, without a single exception they could find. One by one, the men were tested and went storming out, shouting the news. For a minute, the gathering crowd was skeptical, remembering the other failures. Then, abruptly, men were screaming, crying, and fighting for the precious bracky, like the legions of the damned grabbing for lottery tickets when the prize was a passport to paradise. Jake swore as he moved toward the door. We're low on bracky here. Have to get a supply from Edison, I guess, and cart it to the shuttle. Enough for a sample and to make them want more. It'll be tough, but we'll get it there in time. By the time the shuttle should be picking you up, Doc, you've won our war. From now on, if Earth wants to keep her population up, we'll be a free planet. Chris turned slowly from the microscope, holding a slide in her hands. My bugs, she said unbelievingly. Dan, they're dead. Jake patted her shoulder. That makes it perfect, girl. Now come on, we've got to start celebrating a victory. It was the general feeling of most of the heads of the villages when they met next day in Southport, using the courtroom that had been presided over so long by Judge Ben Wilson. It was victory, and to the victor belonged the spoils. The bracky had gone out to Earth on a converted war rocket that could make the trip in less than two weeks, and one packet had been specially labeled for Captain Everts. But Earth had already confirmed the cure. The small amounts of the herb found in the botanical collections had been enough to satisfy all doubts. Harkness, Chris, and Doc had been fighting against the desire to rob Earth blind that filled most of the men for hours now. Now they had the backing of Jake and Ben Wilson, and now, finally, they leaned back, sensing that the argument had been won. Bargaining was all right in its place, but it had no place in affairs of life and death such as this. They had to see that Earth received all the bracky she needed. It was only right to charge a fair price for it, but they couldn't restrict it by withholding or overcharging, and they could still gain their ends without blackmail. Martian alkaloids were tricky things, and bracky smoke contained a number of them. It would take Earth at least ten years to discover and synthesize the right one, and it would still probably cost more than it would to import the weed from Mars. As long as the source of that weed was here and in the hands of the Colonials, there would be no danger of Earth's bombing the planet. Harkness got up to underscore a point that Wilson had made. The plague lived a million years, and it won't disappear now. The jumping headache or Selznick's migraine is unpleasant enough to make us reasonably sure that there will be a steady consumption of the weed. Our problem will be to keep the children from using too much of it, probably. He pulled out a weed— and lighted it, puckering his face as the smoke hit his tongue. I'm told that this gets to be an enjoyable habit. If I can believe that, surely you can believe me when I say we don't have to bargain with lives. The village men were human, and most of them could remember the strain they had been under when they expected those they loved to die at any hour. It made them crave vengeance, but now, as they had a chance to re-examine it, they began to find it harder to impose the horror of any such threat on others. The final vote was almost unanimous. Doc listened as they wrangled over the wording of the message to Earth, feeling disconnected from it. He passed Chris a bracky and lighted it for her. She took it automatically, smiling as the smoke hit her lungs. It was one thing they had in common now, at least. Ben Wilson finally read the message. To the people of Earth, greetings. On behalf of the free people of Mars, I have the honor to announce that this planet hereby declares itself a sovereign and independent world. We shall continue to regard Earth as our mother and to consider the health and welfare of her people in no way second to our own in matters which affect both planets. We trust that Earth will share this feeling of mutual friendship. We trust that all strains of hostility will be ended. The advantages to each from peaceful commerce make any course other than the most cordial of relations unthinkable. 
We shall consider proof of such friendship and order by Earth to all rockets circling this planet that they shall deliver themselves safely into our hands in order that we may begin converting them to peaceful purposes for the trade that is to come. In turn, we pledge that all efforts will be made to ensure a prompt delivery of those products most in demand, including the curative bracky plant. He turned to Doc then. You want to sign it, Dr. Feldman? Making it as acting president or something until we can get around to voting you into permanent office? You and Jake fight over the job, Doc told him. No, Ben, I mean it. He got up and moved out into the outer room where he could avoid the stares of amazement that were turned to him. He'd never asked for the honor, and he didn't want it. Chris came with him. Her face was shocked, and something was slowly draining out of it as he looked at her. Forget it, Chris, he said. You're going back to Earth. There is nothing for you here. She hadn't quite given up. There could be Dan. You know that. No. No, Chris, I don't think there ever can be. You can't find a man strong enough to rule who'll be weak enough to let you rule in his place. It didn't work on Earth, and it won't work here. Forget the dreams you had of what could be done with a new planet. Those are the dreams that made a mess of the old one. I'll be back, she told him. Someday I'll be back. He shook his head again. No, you wouldn't like what you find here. Freedom is heady stuff, but you have to have a taste for it. You can't acquire a fondness for it secondhand. And for a while there's going to be freedom here. Besides, once you get back to Earth, you'll forget what happened here. She sighed at last. For the first time since he had known her, she seemed to give in completely, and for that brief moment he loved what she could have been but never would be. All right, Dan, she said quietly. I can't fight you. I never could, I see now. I'll take the rocket back. What are you going to do? He hadn't bothered to think, but he knew the answer. Research. What else? There would be a lot of research done here. It had been suppressed for too long and had piled up a back pressure that would have to be relieved. And from that research, he suspected, would come the end of the stable oligarchy of Earth. It could never stand against the changes that would be pouring out of Mars. She put her hands on his shoulders and moved forward to kiss him. He bent down to meet her and found her eyes were wet. Maybe his were too. Then she broke free. You're a fool, Dan Feldman, she whispered, and began moving down the hallway and out of the Council Hall of Mars. Doc Feldman nodded slowly as he let her go. He was a fool. He had always been a fool, and always would be. And that was why he could never take over leadership here. Fools and idealists should never govern a world. It took practical men such as Jake to do that. But the practical men needed the foolish idealists, too. And maybe for a time here on Mars, their kind of men and his kind of fools could make one more stab at the ancient puzzle of freedom. Outside, the war rockets of Earth began landing quietly on the free soil of Mars. End Recording <laughs>